Welcome to this Excel masterclass on drop-down lists. Drop-down lists are a powerful Excel feature that allows people to pick an item from a list that you create. They can be used in so many different ways within a spreadsheet and there are some amazing techniques that you should know in order to unleash the full potential of drop-down lists in Excel. That's why I decided to put together this masterclass for you that covers all these techniques from the most fundamental to the most advanced with easy to follow examples. I'm gonna start with the fundamentals of how to create a basic drop-down list for data input. After that, we're gonna take a closer look at more advanced techniques. So I'm gonna explain how to dynamically update a drop-down list with new data and how to apply conditional formatting on static and even on dynamic drop-down lists. And then the second half of this masterclass covers the most advanced amazing techniques and applications, like how to use a lookup function to dynamically extract data from a big dataset based on one or multiple drop-down selections, how to create multi-level drop-down lists with one drop-down list changing its items based on another drop-down selection. And as the final cherry on top, you will learn how to create a searchable drop-down list that automatically filters down the list items to the ones that contain the search term you have entered. So this masterclass will hopefully add a totally new dimension to your Excel skill set and expand the possibilities of what you can do whenever you work with data in Excel. Speaking of data, I want to tell you everything about the sponsor of today's video, DataCamp. No matter what industry you are in, analyzing and understanding data is more critical than ever before. That's why DataCamp provides you with all the tools to learn the most important data science and analytics skills required to succeed in the real world. With over 300 courses from over 250 expert instructors, DataCamp provides plenty of efficient, bite-sized lessons that will easily fit your schedule and can be accessed on any device. I personally love the fact that they have immediate hands-on keyboard exercises so you can smoothly shift from learning into practicing. A DataCamp subscription starts at only $25 per month and for that you get unlimited access to all of their courses and assessment tests. But you guys can sign up with the link in the description to get the first chapter of any course you want for absolutely free. Thanks again to DataCamp and now let's get started with this Excel masterclass. Dropdown lists are often used for simple data input. Let's look at this list of projects. We already have the project names and start dates entered. Now we want to assign a department to each project and set a project status. We could manually type in the department name and project status, but using a dropdown list instead makes these inputs way easier, makes it a way more pleasant user experience and most important, it will ensure data consistency. To insert a basic drop-down list into a cell, select the cell and go to the Data tab. In the Data Tools section, click on the Data Validation button, which opens a small window. Here we can choose between different data validation methods. For the drop-down list, select List. Now there's a new input field that says Source. This is the place where you can define the items that will be in your drop-down list. The most simple approach is to directly enter the items into this field, separated by a comma. Once you're happy with your list, just click OK and now you see this drop-down arrow that allows you to open the drop-down list and select an item that will be inserted into the cell. You can change that item at any time by selecting another item from the drop-down list. Or if you want to delete the cell content, just press the delete key on your keyboard. Now, if you want to rename an item from the list, with this simple drop-down setup, you would have to reopen the data validation window and change the items within this source field. 
This might be okay if you have not more than 5 list items that rarely change, but for lists with many items or many changes, you should go for a cleaner and more flexible approach. Instead of entering the items directly into the source field, I recommend to define the list on a separate worksheet, like I already did here, and then simply reference the list item range using your mouse. Once you click OK, all the items in the referenced range can now be selected in your drop-down list. If you want to rename any of your items now, it is much easier, as you can just go through the other worksheet and change the item's name in the cell directly. The changes will be automatically present in your drop-down list. You can improve the user experience of a drop-down list by adding a helpful input instruction. Let's say project A has multiple departments involved and the user filling out this sheet is not sure which of these involved departments should be selected. To cover that scenario, you can add an input message that helps the user to make a selection. For that, just open the data validation window with the cell selected and in there go to the input message tab. Right at the top you can control the visibility of the input message and below that, that's the place to enter your message. Let's set up a helpful instruction for the department drop-down list and once we are ready, we click OK. Now, whenever the cell with the drop-down list is selected, the input message will be displayed to make it easier for the user. Amazing! Adding a drop-down list option to your cell doesn't mean typing in values directly is not possible anymore. You can still type in values just like in any other cell. Let's try to type in a department that is not on the list. We get an instant error message, because by default the data validation functionality of the drop-down list only allows values that have been defined as items in the list. If you want to allow other values to be entered or want to customize this error message, you can do that in the data validation options. This time you need to go to the third tab that says Error Alert. The checkbox on top allows you to activate or deactivate the data validation completely. Unchecking this box would mean you could enter any value without any validation or message popping up. But if you want to allow other values but still have some sort of control mechanism, you can change the style from Stop to Warning. Now when we try to enter Sales again, this time we get a warning message and now we can decide whether we want to continue or not. So this is a less stricter form of data validation. Another alternative is the information style. This will only bring up a notification that the value differs from the items on the list, but no further questions asked. For most use cases, however, I recommend to just leave the default stop style activated, but something you can do in all scenarios is customizing this error message. So instead of having this generic error text, we can change that to something more useful, like for example, unknown department, please select a department from the list. And now if we enter sales, we get this custom error message instead of that generic one. Pretty cool. Let's take a look at the status column. This is another prime example of a data input field that you want to use a drop-down list for, so that you know which statuses are available and more importantly that status labels are consistent. So just to quickly recap how to do a simple and flexible drop-down setup, let's insert a drop-down list right into the cell. First, we go to the other worksheet and define the list items. Then we select the cell, open the data validation window, select list and reference the defined range of list items. And that's it. Now that we have set up these two drop-down lists for the first row, 
Let's talk about how to copy them to the other rows, because we want to have the same dropdown options there as well. There are basically two ways to quickly copy the dropdown functionality to these lower cells. One way is to select the upper row and use the autocomplete function at the bottom right corner of the range to drag everything down. That copies the dropdown lists, but also the content that we have already selected. So with this method, we would need to clear everything if the cells are non-empty. But now we can just do the same selections as in the cells above for both the department and status column. If you want to make completely sure that only the dropdown functionality is copied to these other cells, select the cells with the dropdown lists, press Ctrl C and then select the rows below, right click and click on paste special. And in the opening window, you have the option to select validation. That way, only the validation settings of the cells are copied down and everything works just fine. Now that we have multiple cells with the same dropdown list stacked on top of each other, there is one question left. If we change the source reference for the dropdown list in one cell, how can we make sure that these changes are applied to all other cells that have the same dropdown settings? It's actually pretty easy. Just select one of the cells, open the data validation window, do whatever changes you want to do, for example, let's exclude these last two departments from the list. And if we now hit OK, these changes would only apply to this one cell. Instead, we check this option which says apply these changes to all other cells with the same settings. And you see, all these similar cells are automatically detected. And if we now click OK, all department dropdown cells have an updated list of items. Amazing. At this point, we have covered all the fundamentals on dropdown lists in Excel. Now we are ready to get you familiar with the more advanced techniques. So let's go. While for some dropdown lists you never want to change any of the items, there are lists that need to frequently undergo changes as items have to be removed or added. Let's take a look at this project task list as an example. It already has some tasks in it and now we want to assign each task to a project member and set the task status. Again, dropdown lists make a lot of sense here, so let's insert the lists with the methods we know. We open the data validation window, select list and reference the range with all team members that we have set up in a separate worksheet. And we do the same for the task status. As the dropdown cells are empty at the moment, we can easily copy these dropdown settings down to the other rows. And as you see, the dropdown lists work perfectly in each row and column. Let's take a second to compare these two drop-down columns. These status values will probably never change within the project duration. So the way we have set it up with absolute cell references is perfectly fine. For the team member column, however, it is probable that we need to make a lot of updates to this list of drop-down items, especially if this is a big project with team members coming and going. For example, let's say Tina joins the team. So we add her to the list on our backend. If we try to find her in the dropdown list, she's not in there because we have set up this list with an absolute range reference that doesn't grow or shrink dynamically. To solve this problem, I will show you two amazing methods that you can use to make this range dynamic. The first method is to transform the list into a table. For that, you can just press Ctrl T Let's quickly change the table layout and set the name to team table. For the dropdown list, we open the data validation window and replace the absolute range reference with the table name. 
Well, Excel somehow doesn't accept the table name directly, even though it detects the table correctly, but to access the table items, we need to put the table name inside the indirect function. Make sure to make the table name a text value by using quotation marks. And of course, don't forget to set the apply to other cells checkmark. And as you see, the range has now dynamically updated and we finally can select Tina. Let's add another team member. Uh, we're going to go for Thomas here. And he is instantly available as well. Pretty cool. The only drawback that comes with this table method is, if you remove team members at the bottom, the table range doesn't shrink again. So we have these ugly white spaces there. And now we would have to manually resize the table range on the second worksheet. That's why I want to show you a second method that I personally prefer. For that second method, at first let's convert the table back to a normal range. The second method is based on the one and only Excel function for dynamic ranges. You've guessed it right, I'm talking about the offset function. If you want to learn more about that function in detail, I got it linked for you in the description. For our purpose here, we only need to reference the first item in the list as the starting point of the range, then we will skip the rows and calls parameter, and then we define the height parameter as the number of non-empty cells going downwards starting at the first reference. Here we use the count a function and pass the potential range of items that we want to cover. So right now we have seven non-empty cells in that potential range and thus the count a function will return the value seven and the offset function takes that value 7 as a height and will return a dynamic array with all the list items, starting at the first item and going down a height of 7. Let's add another team member to show you. As you see, Tina is now part of that dynamic array. And other than the table range, if we remove some of the bottom items, the dynamic array shrinks again. Amazing! We can enter that offset expression directly into the source input field in our data validation setup window. Let's confirm. And now when we add a new team member, the team member is instantly available. And the other way around, when we delete some of the team members on the second worksheet, the list is dynamically reduced and we don't have any of these white spaces. It's open to you to decide which of both methods you prefer, but yeah, I'm interested, let me know in the comments. Conditional formatting allows you to beautifully highlight and visualize your drop-down items. Since you have an at least temporarily fixed set of items in your drop-down list, you can easily assign colors to each individual item that will be displayed once you select it. For a static list like we have here in this example with the status column, it is pretty straightforward to set up conditional formatting rules because you can just hard code these rules as you expect the items to not change over time. So to show you, let's set up some rules to better visualize the task status. For example, let's make the cell have a green fill when we select done as the task status. At first we select the range with all drop down cells. Then in the Home tab, we click on Conditional Formatting and New Rule. This opens up this window where we can define the rule details. Let's use a formula to define a condition. 
And if you define a condition for a range, always use the first cell in the range as your reference cell and then make sure if your range goes over multiple rows to make the row reference a relative reference. So no dollar sign in front of the 5 here. If you do that, this rule will then be active for all rows in that range. To check if the item done has been selected, just set the cell reference equal to the word done. And in case this evaluates to be true, we change the format of the cell to have a green fill and a white font. Click OK. And now this rule is active for all drop down cells in the column. Let's set up a second rule for the in progress status. We set the first cell in the range equal to in progress. And then format the cell to have a gray fill and white font. That works perfectly. And now we have three different fill colors for each individual status. The setup for this static dropdown list was so quick and easy because we just used the text values directly when we set up the rules. If we want to set up something similar for a more dynamic column like these team members, we have to go for a more flexible approach. We cannot simply set up a rule for Michael because Michael might be gone by tomorrow and then we would have to change the rule manually to whomever takes his place. So let's see how we can set up a dynamic conditional formatting that automatically assigns an individual color to each team member independently from the actual name. As we don't want to get visually overwhelmed by all the colors on the screen, let's add a new column right in front of the drop down column and set up the conditional formatting there. So each team member will have an individual small color code right in front of the name. That means we're gonna set up conditional formatting in a cell that is not the actual drop down cell, but it will be based on that actual drop down cell. To also add these colors in the back end worksheet, we insert the same column there. And one thing we should do when we set up a conditional formatting for a dynamic column, we should set a limit to the number of items that we built this for. Technically, you can create this dynamic color coding for as many items as you want, but we're gonna create it for up to 8 team members now. Again, we start by selecting the range for which we want to add the conditional formatting and create a new rule. Be careful this time, we're not gonna use the first cell in the range, but the drop down cell right next to the first cell in the range. Now that we don't exactly know what the exact value in there will be, we're gonna set up the color coding not for a hard coded text value like Michael, but we simply gonna reference the items in the second worksheet by their list position. So this first rule will be true whenever the first item of the list is selected. Make sure that this reference is an absolute cell reference, so you need dollar signs in front of both column and row. Then we select the color code for this first item in the list. And one cool thing you can do is use your theme colors for your items, because then you have the opportunity to easily change the whole color code set with only a single click. For the first list item, we gotta select this color and then we're gonna copy that expression so that we can reuse it. As I said, I will set up this dynamic color coding for up to eight list items, so we have to add seven additional rules here. I'm just gonna insert the first condition and increase the row number by one. So this time the drop down cells will be compared against the second item in our list and we set the format to the next color in the theme color set. We just repeat that six more times, each time referencing the next item in the list.
once we have set up all eight rules, you can see we have a little issue here. It seems like the last rule we have set up is somehow active for all the empty cells. But we're gonna fix that in a second. Just to show you that the color coding works for the list items, let's select a few items. And the color codes are displayed correctly. Now let's fix this default color issue for the empty cells, because actually we want them to be empty if no item is selected. The issue at the moment is that we don't have an item in the list on the second worksheet at position 8. So all empty cells on the first worksheet are equal to this empty position in our backend list. To fix this, we need to add one additional rule. With this rule, we simply check if the dropdown cells are empty, so if no item is selected. We don't set any format for this one, we just insert it. This additional rule is added on top of all other rules in our conditional formatting rule manager. You have to know that these rules are tested and applied from top to bottom. So if we set this stop if true checkbox to active, this first rule basically stops the other rules from being applied if we have no item selected. Pretty helpful to know that. Now all empty team member dropdown cells have no color code displayed. And that's how it should be. With this setup now, it doesn't matter how many of the 8 potential items we have defined on the second worksheet and what their exact value is. If we only have two team members, the color codes are displayed for these two. If we add three additional team members, they automatically have their own color code assigned, which is pretty amazing. As the last part of this dynamic conditional formatting, I recommend to also color code the list items on the second worksheet, so that you immediately know the color code for all defined list items. The simple way would be to just fill each cell with the respective color, like this, first color, second color, and so on. The only drawback here is the colors would be displayed even if there is no item at that position. Well, I don't know how you feel about this, but I personally prefer to make this color coding dynamic as well, in a sense that the color for each item is fixed, but will only be displayed if a team member is entered on that list position. To make this happen, we have to set up a similar conditional formatting, but this time we need to set up one rule for each individual cell. The condition this time is, if this cell is not empty, then set the fill to the respective color. We basically repeat that for the other potential list items, And at the end, we have 8 cells, each one with its own conditional formatting rule. And the amazing result looks like this. Now we can define the list items here. Each item automatically gets its own individual color assigned, while the empty positions have no color. And in the front end, we can select all defined items and their respective color codes are automatically displayed. This dynamic color coding technique is definitely something that will upgrade and improve the user experience on your worksheet. Um, yeah, I admit it's a bit of effort, but I think the result is definitely worth it in this case. 
So far, we have used drop-down lists only for data input, but you can also use them for extracting insights from a given dataset and, for example, building reports or quickly getting specific information. A very powerful technique for this is the combination of drop-down lists and the VLOOKUP function. To get you familiar with the concept, let's start with a simple example. Let's say we want to be able to quickly get supplier information based on a supplier ID. We have a big data set with supplier data and what is really crucial here, the supplier ID column is our primary key column. That means it only has unique values and with each of these IDs, we can uniquely identify the relevant name, division and city information in the data set. Now, to make our information lookup worksheet really user-friendly, we add a drop-down list to this cell, which has all the available supplier IDs covered. We reference the supplier ID column in the supplier dataset, and to allow more suppliers to be added in the future, we use the offset formula that I have introduced earlier. Now, with this drop-down list, we have all available supplier IDs listed and now we can easily select the one we are interested in within a second. To display the relevant information based on the selected supplier ID, let's insert the VLOOKUP function. As the lookup value, just reference this drop-down cell. The table array is just a whole dataset and we're gonna add some additional potential rows as buffer for new data. The column index for the name is two, and as the last parameter, we select false to get an exact match. Right now, this returns an NA error, which is no surprise as we have no lookup supplier ID selected. Now, if we have nothing selected, this NA error doesn't really look pretty, uh, we want to have something more useful as an alternative output value here. So let's use the ifNA function. With this function, you can define an alternative return value every time VLOOKUP returns an NA error. Here, we just return no data in that case. For the other two values to be extracted, let's just copy this formula, paste it, and simply change the column index. The division column is the third column in the dataset and the city is the last column in the dataset. And that's the setup for this simple example case. Now we can use the supplier ID dropdown list to quickly extract custom information from the supplier dataset. Pretty amazing. But to be frank with you, that was easy because we had our data set up with an ID and we directly used that ID to extract information. But what if the rows in our data don't have a unique ID and no other single column with unique values? This is when you can make use of multiple drop-down lists to extract specific information from your data. Let's take a look at this revenue and profit dataset. For each year and each division, we have a revenue, profit and profit margin value. And obviously the year and division column are the lookup columns. But notice that none of both has purely unique values. In the year column, the year appears multiple times. And the same applies for the division column. But we still have a potential primary key in here. And that is the year and division combined because for each year division combination, there is only one single row in that dataset. The only issue is VLOOKUP cannot have two columns as lookup columns. So the way to work around this is to add an artificial composed lookup column right in front of the other two columns. Let's move the dataset one column to the right and create a composed key column here. And the composed key value is simply the year and division value concatenated as a text. Let's just add this formula for all rows and now we have the lookup column we need. 
even though we now have that one column in our data with unique values, it wouldn't make much sense from a user experience perspective to directly create one dropdown list off of this column. We still want to have two dropdown lists, one to select the year and another one for the division. The big problem is, if we reference the year or division column as our dropdown list source reference, we have each item multiple times in there, but we only want to have unique values in the dropdown list. For that exact reason, we need to prepare the list items on a separate sheet. You could enter them manually, but if you want to automatically extract all unique values from your data, you can do that easily in the latest Excel versions with the unique function. This function is a dynamic array function that returns all unique values of a given range. As the range, we insert the year column from the data as a dynamic range using the offset function. This way we guarantee that all years are extracted even if new rows are added to the original dataset. There we have all unique year values listed and then we can reuse this formula. Just change the column from C to D to extract the unique divisions. Beautiful! We are now ready to set up the drop down lists. Usually, to grab our prepared list dynamically, we would again use the offset function. But here we can take advantage of the fact that our prepared list already is a dynamic array. Because now you can simply reference the first cell, and this is the cell that actually has the dynamic array formula in it, and then add a hash symbol to grab all dynamically spilled values. As you see, that works perfectly. Let's do the same for the division dropdown. Reference the first cell in the list, add the hash symbol, and click OK. And that's how all these values are covered in the drop down list. To extract the revenue and profit information, we again insert the VLOOKUP function wrapped inside the IFNA function. And now for the lookup value, we need to compose the year and division value just like we already did in our data set. So we use multiple lookup values combined to create the composed key. For the table array, let's reference the dataset plus a little bit of buffer again. The column index for revenue is 4. We want to have an exact match. And the alternative error value is no data. For the profit field, we duplicate that formula and change the column index to 5. And for the profit margin, the column index is 6. That's the whole setup. Let's test it. Uh, at first, we want to know the numbers for 2010 and the utility division. That works perfectly. just like all the other divisions as well. Let's also change the year. And again, all these specific numbers are perfectly extracted and presented to us. Pretty cool. Finally, to test the flexibility of this whole setup, let's add some new data to the dataset. To make it exciting, let's add a new year and a completely new division. Let's go to the prepared lists and as you see, both new values are automatically covered by these dynamic arrays and thus also available in the drop-down lists. 
And the revenue and profit data that we just added is also available without us doing anything. That's the magic of combining dropdown lists and VLOOKUP. Of course, this technique isn't limited to this lookup function only. It can be used with any other lookup function or formula, so feel free to test it out yourself. Multi-level dependent dropdown lists are another hot topic in Excel. The basic idea is to have one dropdown list's items depending on what has been selected in another dropdown list. I want to explain the most straightforward technique on how to realize that. Let's look at this simple example. We want to select a region first with one dropdown list. The regions are the column headers in our sample data. And then based on which region has been selected, we want a country dropdown list to only display countries of that selected region. So if the selected region is Asia, we want the country dropdown list to have these four items. If it is Europe, we want a country dropdown list to have these six items. And the same for America. The way we're gonna do this is we start by naming each of these ranges. We start with the headers and call it regions. Then we select the ranges with the respective countries and make the name equal to the region header. So in this case, Asia. This range is Europe and that one is America. To set up the regions dropdown list, we now only have to set the source to equals regions and the dropdown list displays all items of that range. No big deal. For the country dropdown list, however, we cannot simply type in the name of a range directly because we don't know which of these three we actually want to have displayed. To make this list depending on the other dropdown list selection, we need to use the indirect function to interpret the value that has been selected here as a formula. So if Asia is the cell value here, it will be interpreted as a formula and thus as the named range that we just defined. For now, this gives us an error value because we have nothing selected in the first dropdown list. That's totally fine. But as soon as we select Asia, this dropdown list has all the Asian countries listed. If we select Europe, now we can choose between all the European countries and the same applies for America. This is how you can easily set up dependent dropdown lists. But what if you want to make these country lists dynamic so that you can easily add new countries without manual adjustment? Unfortunately, you cannot use the offset function this time to make the named range dynamic. But we can still use the table method and just convert each of these ranges into a table. Then we call the tables TBL Asia, TBL Europe, and TBL America. After that, we open the name manager and assign the dynamic table columns to the single region names that we use within the indirect function of the country dropdown list. You see, it still refers to the exact range, but now this range automatically increases with new entries. At the moment, America is selected, so we have these five American countries listed. Let's add two other South American countries to the list. And there they are. 
Let's add another Asian country. Select Asia with the regions drop down list. And there we have that new country in Asia automatically included. The same of course also works for Europe. Dependent drop-down lists are definitely a technique you should try out for yourself. So let me know in the comments what you think about that technique. We have arrived at the last part of this Excel masterclass. So let's talk about searchable drop-down lists. This is definitely among the coolest techniques with drop-down lists. Because with this technique you can type in a search term and filter down the drop-down list to only those items that contain this specific search term. This filtered data area is where we prepare the dynamic list content that we then reference for the drop-down list. If you have Office 365 you can create this really really fast with the filter function. But for everyone else with an older Excel version don't worry, I won't let you down. I will explain how to create the filter functions functionality with a little more complex but super smart workaround. Let's go! The basic idea of the filter function is to filter down a given array of values by comparing it to one value like a search term. In its simplest form, the filter function requires you to reference an array, then for the second argument, uh, which is called include, set the search term equal to the array. This will do a row-wise comparison and return a same sized array of true and false values. And for the last argument, simply enter a message to be displayed if no match is found. The problem is, this simple comparison only returns those rows that exactly match the search term. So when we only type in the first name Tyrese, nothing is found. We have to type in the full name to get a match. For our drop-down list, however, we want to return all items that have the search term at some position in the text. So if we enter the first three characters, TYR, we want all items to be displayed that contain this little text part. So let's start by building the formula we need from inside out. We start with the search function. With that function we can do a row-wise comparison of the search term and the items in the dataset. Now this will give us a dynamic array which for each item has either the position index of the search term in the text or it gives us an error value if the search term hasn't been found. If we only search for Y, there are a lot more rows with numbers. The second item, for example, has the letter Y at the third position. If we now take this expression and put it inside the isNumber function, we will get a true value for each row that has the search term in it and all other rows are false. And this is all we need for our filter function, because the second argument, which is called include, requires an array of that exact form. The filter function now returns a dynamic array that contains all items with the search term in them. And that is all we need to set up a drop-down list. And as you might remember from the unique function, which also is a dynamic array function, we can simply reference the first cell with the filter function in it and get all the other values of that dynamic array by using the hash symbol. Now, when we type in a search term, this error message comes up, which is actually no surprise as we still have data validation fully activated. This particular use case is one of the rare cases in which it makes absolutely sense to turn off data validation completely to temporarily allow search terms to be entered that are not exactly in the list. So let's open the data validation window again and turn the error message off. Now if we type in a search term it is absolutely no problem, no error message and the drop-down list is automatically filtered down to only those items that contain that specific term. It just works perfectly. Amazing. I think this technique can bring a lot of value to your worksheets. That's why we should definitely take a closer look on how to implement this for the older Excel versions as well. 
so let's get right into it. Those of you with an older Excel version have to go through a few more steps. I'm sorry, but that's how it is. We have to somehow replicate what the filter function does. What we can reuse from this expression is this part that tells us if the search term is part of a text or not. Let's copy that and insert it right into this separate column. This time we're not gonna search the whole array at once, but only the item in this row. We want to use this formula in all cells of this column, so we have to make the search cell an absolute cell reference with dollar signs. Let's add this formula to all rows, and right now it displays true for all rows because we have no search term entered yet, but as soon as we enter something, it displays true only for a few rows. Now we're gonna take that expression and wrap it inside an if function. And if that expression is true, we want to return, and this might be not super intuitive right now, but makes sense in a second, the maximum of the range D4 to D4. Right now this might look a bit odd to you, but we make the first D4 reference an absolute cell reference. And for the second D4, we make the row relative. So if we drag this formula down and add it to the other rows, the range will always be going from D4 to the cell that is right above the cell containing the formula. We not only compute this max value, but also increment it by one. And if this first expression is false, we just want to return a zero. Let's update all rows with this new formula. And now you see this formula basically indexed all the items that contain the search term. Every time the search term is part of the item text, we look at the highest value so far and add one to that. Bryson is the first employee to have BR in its name. So the max value is zero and we add one to get one. Then for all these without BR in their names, we just return a zero. And then Broderick is the second guy that has BR in its name. The max value in the range above his row is one, so the formula returns two, and so on and so on. If we change the search term just to A, a lot more values are indexed now and comparing to the filter formula output, uh, we see that the indexed values are exactly the one also returned by the filter formula, so it seems to work. Now we only need to find a smart way to list all these indexed items right below each other and ignore all the remaining items. Let me start by introducing the rows function, which returns the number of rows in a given range. We pass a range, starting with the first cell as a fixed anchor and ending at the cell of the formula. So if we drag this down, it will just give us a series of one, two, three, four, and so on. Um, and we're gonna use that formula inside the VLOOKUP function, because we want to look up the index one in the first row, the index two in the second row, and so on. We pass this whole array as lookup table and define the column index as two. And then we set it to exact match. Now let's update all rows in this column with this formula. And you see the row wise output is now the same as for the filter function. Amazing. The only issue is if the index cannot be found, the function returns a NA error. But as we already know, we can easily catch this with the if na function and return an empty string value as an alternative. From a visual standpoint, the output is now exactly the same. There is still a significant difference because the left output is a dynamic array and can be easily referenced, while the right output is not dynamic yet. So when we now open the data validation window again, we cannot simply use the first cell plus hash symbol reference, but we need to make use of the offset formula again. Only this time, instead of using count a, we need to use the count if function, because count a counts the empty string cells as not completely empty cells. 
Since there is no actual character in these cells, we can use the COUNTIF function to count the cells that have at least one character in them by putting in this wildcard expression as search term. The question mark stands for any one character and the star means zero or more characters. So both together are a wildcard for one or more characters. Let's click OK and check if everything works correctly. And as you see, the searchable drop-down list has the exact same behavior as the one with the filter function. That's simply great. Now every one of you, no matter which Excel version you have, knows how to upgrade drop-down cells in Excel with this amazing feature. We are at the end of this intense Excel masterclass. A perfect time to remind you to take a look at DataCamp and sign up for their free content using the link in the description. I hope this Excel training was an amazing learning experience for you and I'd be really happy about your feedback. That being said, I wish you a beautiful day and see you next time. Cheers!